I said adult participatory, I need four adults. Don't make me pick you. <laughs> All right, I got one, I got two, I need two more. Come, just come on up. <laughs> All right, you volunteered first. Sure. So what I want you to do, I want you to carry these three books. I want you to walk up this aisle, around the back, back down here in the front, and send back down. Uh-huh. Right. You, you, you actually volunteered third. You volunteered second. Okay. So you get these two books. I want you to walk up the middle aisle and walk back down. You, you, you volunteered third. I did? Yes. So you take that book and walk to that door and back. And you volunteer for so You just walk to that chair and come back. And take the book spec down. And then line up back in order. See, if you'd known I was going to pay you, you would have come up here, wouldn't you? <laughs> There's your pay for helping. Thank you. You can do it with whatever you want. Thank you. All right. They all got the same thing. Was that fair? Did they all do the same thing? You guys can go sit down now. Thank you. Right? They got the same thing for doing a job that I called them up here to do, but they didn't do the same job, right? They did different things. That's what Matthew talks to us about today. He talks about the laborers in the vineyard, the landowner going out to the, to the town square and finding people to go out and work for him in his vineyard. Matthew shows us a radical reversal of cultural understandings by presenting a parable intended to deal with the resentment generated within a community by God's grand and gracious reversal. Matthew understands the theme of both the eschatological vision and the parable to be the last shall be first and the first shall be last. The eschatological reversal, that means the end time reversal, is already lived out in the career of the Son of Man, in Jesus Christ, who came and suffered in His death as a vindication of what God was going to do for each and every one of us. Right? This parable finds us doing and thinking what we think is right. Those who were, came first to the, to the vineyard, when they got to the end and they got their daily wage, which they agreed to at the beginning of the parable, remember that. The landowner went out, found the people, negotiated with them. They agreed to what they were going to get paid. But when it came to them actually getting paid, they grumbled because they thought they should have gotten more because those who came later got what they got. By our standards, it's not fair. It's not right. Right? It's the same thing that Jonah talks about. Right? The Ninevites are evil. They need to be destroyed not fair. It's not right. Yet when we compare ourselves to what God is doing for us, we're always going to be coming up short according to God's standards. Always. Because God's standards upset the world's assumptions about what needs to happen in our day in and day out life. But we're left with gaps in this parable, right? The landowner went out in the morning and then he went back out again at 9 o'clock. And then he went back out again at noon. And he went back out again at 3. And he went back out again at 5. Why does this landowner need this many workers to begin with? Why does he have to keep going back out into the marketplace to find more people to work for him? Is his vineyard that big and he just didn't find enough? The parable doesn't tell us. Why were these ones who were hired last standing there idle for the majority of the day? Why were they not seen in the marketplace earlier? The parable doesn't tell us. Right? If he's out hiring workers for his vineyard, obviously it's harvest time. So he is trying to harvest his fields. So the other workers may have been someplace else working. Maybe they're lazy. Maybe they're hiding. Maybe it's the fact that there's so many people standing out in the marketplace wanting to get a job because that's what these people had to do in order to maintain the livelihood of their family. Not to make extra money to go spend on anything frivolous. To make the money they needed to put food on the table for that day. 
they needed the money to feed their family that day. Maybe there were so many of them out there, these people were at the back of the crowd and they couldn't be seen. We don't know. And we could conjecture all morning about that. We're not going to, just so you know. But we could conjecture all morning about that, but it's not going to change anything about the parable because they're not important details for us to get what we need to get from this story. The landowner hires the workers, and the first workers agree to the normal daily wage, which would have been one denarius, which isn't much. The hired hands that are hired after that, right? He, he negotiated with the first, but then when he went back at nine and noon and three, he said, I will give you whatever is right. He didn't say he was going to give them the normal daily wage. He said, I'll give you whatever is right or proper or just or fair. Whatever's fair. So that leads us to the question of just what is right other than this is my right hand. Just what is right? What is fair? And what is just? Right? The complainants, those first hired, assumed that they would receive more because when they saw the last getting the daily's wage, they thought, oh, well, we've been here twice as long three times, four times as long as some of these people have been here. So we're obviously going to get more. They assumed they would get more, and that desire for more is usually considered to be greed, which undoubtedly led them to desire more than they had been promised. Because remember, they made an agreement for a daily's wage. They complained that they thought they were going to get more. The other complaint that they had is, you've made us equal to them. They assumed a hierarchy based on the time, amount of time that they've worked, right? They are more important to the landowner because they worked longer in his vineyard. They assumed that they would get a difference of pay because they worked longer. They make a distinction between us and them. We are better than they are. We deserve more money than they do, right? They've borne the burden of the heat and the day. Remember, I said these are people who are standing in the marketplace because they had to have the money for that day to put food on their family's table. But their complaint is that they've borne the burden and the heat of the day. They do not see their invitation to work as something that is good for them. It gives them their needed wages earned. It gives them a sign of grace that they don't have to have the burden of having, wondering how they're going to pay for their family's food for the day. And when we look at other people around us and see what we're doing and wonder why they have more than we do and we see our burden as living as Christians as something, as a burden, that our lives of being a Christian is a burden, then there's some faulty seeing going on. Robert Smith in his commentary on Matthew said it wonderfully about this passage. He said, it is simply a fact that people regularly understand and appreciate God's strange calculus of grace as applied to themselves, but fear and resent seeing it applied to others. Let me read that again. It's simply a fact that people regularly understand and appreciate God's strange calculus of grace as applied to themselves, but fear and resent seeing it applied to others. When we see God be gracious to other people, we get upset. When we see other people having gracious things happen to them, we get upset because it's not fair. It's not right. It's not just. But that's how God is. It's the same way in the parable we read last week of the unforgiving servant. It suggested a great appreciation of God forgiving all of our sins. When the king forgave the servant who he was going to throw into prison, everything that he owed him. And then that person went out and grabbed hold of one of the other slaves and threw him into prison for what he had owed. Because it's not about God being gracious to someone else. It's about God being gracious to me. I desire that God and I should punish all of those who have sinned against me. That's our normal understanding. That's what we want. But that's not God's way. Because God's answers are not always, and most likely aren't, our answers. And sometimes we may not like what God's answer is to some of these problems. 
Because God is generous, right? It says at the end of our passage today, Matthew chapter 20, verse 15, the landowner asked one of the people who is complaining against him, or are you envious because I am generous? Remember what I said earlier about what he was paying these people? It's a normal daily wage that pays for your food for one day for your family. Would you consider that to be generous? I don't think it's very generous. It's a minimum wage that a family in poverty could exist on. These wages aren't great. Even for those who only worked an hour, this is not a great wage because all it gets them is their food for the day. The workers have barely enough to live on and they remain in poverty and their needs for this day will only be met, which means they're going to have to be out in the marketplace again tomorrow. Thus, it may be better to translate the word that we see as generous as good. It was good for the landowner to give the workers a minimum wage, enough for that day. It was not generous. And what about those who were said that the landowner asked, why are you idle all day? What does that mean? Literally not working, not doing anything, not being effective. And the cure for being unemployed, at least from this parable's understanding, has to come from someone willing to invite them to work. This results in two benefits. The hired are given what they need, they get work and they get money to sustain their family. And the hirer receives what they need. Someone to go out into the vineyard and do my work. Which leads us to a question. Does God need you to do anything for Him? I'm, I'm, I heard a yes, I heard a no, I heard a... It's an interesting question. It really is an interesting question. Because Matthew brings this up over and over again. He says several times, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Right? Matthew says that God needs people to go out and do harvesting for him. But, as Lutherans, we believe what? We don't like works righteousness. We don't like saying that we have to do something in order to gain something, right? Right? By getting works righteousness is when we get what we deserve, when we do enough to get our way in. What, what do I have to do to be saved? Jesus is asked over and over again in the Gospels. What do I have to do to be saved? But as Lutherans, we don't believe in that because we are saved by grace through faith, not of our own works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2 8 and 9. And we think because of that, we don't have to do anything. And it's kept us from seeing the importance and the necessity of good works. I have a a wonderful conversation on Facebook, um, usually about once a year, with a Catholic friend of mine who says that we as Lutherans forget a verse, which we'll get to here in a moment in Ephesians. It's not what we have to do to get saved. But the question is, you are saved So what are you going to do about it? It's not, what do I have to do to be saved? You are saved. So now what are you going to do about it? Another question that this might get us to look at is, because you're saved, how do you show the rest of the world that that is a fact? A Jewish scholar once stated, the reason the Orthodox Jews seek to obey all 613 commands in the Torah is not works righteousness. We are already God's people because God said so. But so that the rest of the world knows that we are God's chosen people. Orthodox Jews try to uphold the law not because it will get them anything, but to show the rest of the world what they already have. Right? The cure for our unfulfilled and non-productive lives is not going out and finding something else to fill up those voids, to fill up our time, to do things just because we need to do it that just benefits me. But hearing our owner's invitation to go and work in his vineyard, I believe that the graciousness of this landowner and the graciousness of God is not the fact that he paid them a measly, lousy daily wage 
But it's the fact that he went out over and over and over again into the marketplace to say, you go and work, you go and work, you go and work, you go and work. It's not how much he paid them, it's the fact that he invited them to come and work in the first place. It's not the money, it's the invitation that makes him generous. Right? It's not because the landowner paid them but because he gave them a place to work and an invitation to come and be a part of something. He invites God, invites everybody. And he invites someone that we don't think should be there. Right? And is that fair? Is that right? Is that just? Because I guarantee you, There's someone that's invited by God that thinks that I shouldn't be invited. And there's someone that's invited by God that thinks that you shouldn't be invited. But God invites each and every one of us to come into his vineyard and to be a worker with him. Just remember his ways are not our ways, right? God's ways are not our ways. His answers are not our answers. But he has invited you to go and work. Not for what you will get, Right? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one can boast. We can't do anything to obtain our salvation, but you are saved. So what are you going to do about it? Because my Catholic friend who keeps reminding me, as Lutherans were really good at spouting off Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, but we forget about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, which says, For we are what he has made us created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand to be our way of life. For we are saved by grace through faith, not of our own doing. It is a gift of God, not the result of works, so that we can't boast, but it's because we were created in the image of Christ to go out and do good works for God that He prepared for us before He even put us on this place. Because He's invited and called each and every one of us to go out into the world where He has prepared labor for us to do. Just us. Only you can do it. And He's called and invited you to go out and do it. So go out into the world and graciously invite everyone else that you see to come and join us in the garden of God, gracious and wonderful creation, and doing the work what God has given us to do because of his love and grace and mercy that flows down over all of our lives, each and every moment that we're here. Amen.